good, good. In case you don't know me, I'm Joel, one of the elders here. Uh, we are continuing in Acts 5, chapter 5, starting in verse 17 today. 5, 17. Um, there's a lot to cover, so let's pray. Father, I thank you. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for these men. I thank you, God, for a chance to, uh, to, to get together, Lord, to dig into your word, to, um, Lord, to be instructed, to be renewed, to have our minds renewed. Um, Father, I ask that, Lord, you send your spirit here to be, to be with us, to instruct us, to, um, to guide and lead me. Lord, help me to get out of your way. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, Acts chapter 5, verse 17. Okay, so we, we, be, not 5, 17, we begin to see um, kind of a new facet, a new, uh, not new, but, but it's the first time it's highlighted uh, the, the power of God in, in a way. Uh, in, in the early part of Acts, we're seeing all these big, healings and everybody's getting healed and just just the sh- just the shadow of Peter people are getting healed and and um, and so we begin to see a, a picture now in the second part of Acts 5 where um, God is showing to us God began to show to them the the walking out the walking in, in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the power of God rather than just the, just the the big gifts and and, and um, if you recall if you were here uh, Sunday was anybody here Sunday anybody here um, if you were here Sunday Pastor David he he's used this illustration for years as a good one of of the the gifts of the Spirit and the illustration of a train and we can watch a train heading down a track a locomotive and there's a doot doot and we see the steam explode out of the top and we we can have the the false impression that that's what that steam is for. It's to make the whistle blow. And so, ooh, hey, look, the whistle blow. And all the kids, hey. And so it's for us to look at, for us to hear, and that's the purpose of the steam. But the purpose of the steam is to, is to drive the train. And that's the same, same with the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit, yes, we can have gifts. Yes, we can uh, do the things to, described in Scripture as, as gifted by the, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, yes, we still see people getting healed here in this place. Um, but that's not the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to drive His church, to drive us, to, to, to make us doers and give us the power to do what He's asked. Um, and I'm going to... Sorry, guys. Um, John 16, 13. 13 through 14. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. We need to be careful and and discerning of, of things that people claim to be the Holy Spirit. If they are not glorifying Jesus, it's not the Holy Spirit. It's just a show. If, they're not, if it's not ra- raising up Jesus and exalting Jesus in your, own, in your heart, in the hearts of others, in, in, um, th- then we can know, we can test that Spirit. And it, that's, that's not the Holy Spirit. Uh, Acts one eight, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. That's again the power that, that the Holy Spirit has given us is the power to go. I didn't show you that one. Uh, Acts one eight. We're going to quote from Leonard Ravenhill: The early church was married to poverty, prisons, persecutions. Today, the church is married to prosperity, personality, and popularity. Um, there's a reason I got that. It says some dude said, and I just want to kind of tongue-in-cheek, this 
anything outside of Scripture, any, any quotes, you know, they're, yes, there's value there, yes, but we need to, be, need to be lowering that below the Word of God. And so this is a p- powerful quote. Um, same thing with me. This guy up here, bloviating, is the, p- the Word of God that, is, that brings the power. So um, the early church was married to poverty, prisons, persecution. Today the church is married to prosperity, personality, and popularity. And we see this in, our, in the American church that, for all intents and purposes, it's dying. There's, there's a few pockets around that, that the church is growing, but it's largely because the people of God has gra- have grabbed onto this desire to be prosperous, not that there's something wrong with prosperity itself, and they've, they've hooked their, their hearts and minds to peep these big personalities, and they want to be popular rather than uh, speaking the truth. And this is going to be kind of the... I'm going to couch this entire teaching in this. Um, so in the first part of 5, we see that uh, God, God killed Ananias and Sapphira. And I believe that he, he began a cleansing to purify the early church in Jerusalem. And uh, there's another phase of this cleansing that we're, going to, that we're going to begin to see here. Those who, yeah, man, I want to, I want to sign up to heal people. Yeah, man, I want to sign up to to do amazing miracles, but I'm not sure I want to sign up to suffer. And so he, 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 we begin and, and, and see this where he begins to, to allow the church to suffer, um, walking in strength through the Holy Spirit, but, but allow, allow them to suffer to, to purify the church. Um, but it, was, it, it, it got to the point... In the, uh, in the early church that, that's, that Peter had so much um, filling from the Spirit, so, so much ability to, to uh, walk out what God was doing, that people were, people were just laying people in his path. And, they, and he, would walk by, he would walk by, they would hope that his shadows pass on, and they were getting healed just based, based on the, the, his shadow passing by. And it's a, um, so there's a reason that, that the Lord begins to, um, to, to purify. There's a reason because we see with Ananias and Fire, they come with kind of half-hearted. They come with kind of maybe, sort of. And so now we're going to jump into 17 and uh, 18, or 17 and 18. Then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, which was the sect of the Sadducees, they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. As was last week, we talked about walking in gifts that you've not been given. The, the high priest, what was his job? His job was not to, uh, to speak to the people and correct them. His job was to go to God on behalf of the people, to pr- to, to sacrifice on behalf of the people and to pray for the people on behalf of the people. It is the prophet's job that, that, go, that goes to the people on behalf of God. So, so the, already we see here the high priest is walking in something he's not been called to do, which is to go correct the people. And so we see the called out here the Sadducees, and there was a, there was a couple major groups of people in that day, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and and we can liken them uh, somewhat to the Sadducees, we liken to our academic um, liberal theologians. Uh, they, had a, they had a tendency to remove from Scripture the things. They didn't add to Scripture. They, you know, the Bible was, the, the, the Torah was the Torah, but they, we kind of believe what we want to believe. They took out anything supernatural. They didn't want to believe that. Anything about resurrection, they didn't want to believe that. So they, they had a low view of Scripture. Uh, Pharisees, on the other hand, we could kind of liken to Amish or fundamental, super fundamentalists and who, who tend to add to the Scripture, who tend to, um, you know, Bi- Bible says not to be drunk. They say you cannot drink. The Bible says this. They say you can add another layer. And, and so they tend to add layers and layers and layers around rules, um, around laws that the, that the Bible gave. So that they're adding, yes, they, yes, they took the word of truth and they, they accepted all of that, but then they added to it. So they kind of 
fell on the other side, the attitude. But they had a, they had a high view of Scripture. They tended to have a high view of Scripture. And we see throughout the Scriptures that um, there were Pharisees that came to know the Lord. But we don't, that I'm aware of, we don't have a single recording of a Sadducee who came, came to the Lord. One of you uh, guys may be able to correct me, but I don't, I'm not aware of a single recording in Scripture of that. Um, and I think part of that is, is if you, those of you who've been here a long time, if you remember Pastor David talking about the idea of an of a open fool or a closed fool, um, there, to some degree we all walk in a bit of foolishness. We don't, we don't have everything down right. And you have those that are, that are unbelie- uh, unbelievers and, and, and they believe in some set of foolishness. Um, and I don't mean that in a, in a derogatory sense, but it's just, it's not the truth. And so, but you have those that they will not, when they're presented with truth, it doesn't matter. They, they're here, they don't care what the truth is. And you have those that are open to learn. And there's kind of the difference there between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They, the Pharisees had received all, that God, all the truth that God had given to them before. They'd built more on it. But they'd received all of that truth. And so their hearts were open to receive from the Lord. And I think we, that's why we see many more of them who came to the Lord. Whereas the Pharisees, this is God's word. Yeah, but I'm gonna, I don't like that. And I don't like that. And I don't like that. So we're going to just forget about that. Um, and so the the point being, the, there's a a critical uh, mindset uh, as as we grow in the Lord. Is we we need to just as the Pharisees had a high view of the, the scriptures and the and the Sadducees had a low view of scriptures. It is important. Um, life lesson here, criti- critical to maturing in your walk with Jesus is to have a high view of God, a high view of His Word, and a, and a low view of your opinion. And you would be surprised how many people have a very high view of their opinion. And this is, this is critical for many reasons uh, when, it, when it comes to, to having grace with others, with people that you disagree with. Understand it's largely or often your opinion that you're holding super high. And I'm, oh, whatever, I don't believe this guy. Uh, critical to maturing your walk with Jesus is to have a high view of God, a high view of his word, and a low view of your opinion. So going on to 19 to 20 here, 21. But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, and brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple, and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with them came and called the council together, and with all the elders of the children of Israel, and sent the prison, and sent to the prison. Golly, I'm not reading well. Let's try that verse again. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early. In the morning and taught, but the high priest and those with him came and called the council together and with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. So here we are. Uh, They have been wrongly accused. They've been thrown in prison. They've been miraculously freed. And then they were were told to go and share. And the question is, what have you been freed from? What have you been freed from? Um, some of us have serious sins that we've been freed from. Some of us have serious bondage that we've been freed from, fear that we've been freed from. Um, all of us who claim Jesus as our Savior have been freed from sin. And so what is our, what is, our, um, what is Freedom in Christ, and many, many like to throw out the idea that freedom in Christ is this is a freedom to do what I want. If, if there's a if there's a gray area in the Scripture, I'm free to do what I want, and that's kind of the idea. What what gets promoted is I'm free in Christ, and yes, the reality is yes, we're free in Christ, but we're, but that freedom that's given to us is freedom not to sin. It's it's a freedom to 
no longer sin. But prior to when we walked with Christ, prior to when we were saved and converted, we had no choice but to sin. But you might say, well, I, there's a lot of times before I walked with Christ that I, that I did a good thing or, or I chose not to do a bad thing. But the reality is all you do in those instances is you trade one sin for another because, hey, I didn't do this. Man, I'm such a good guy. Look at how awesome I was over there when I didn't do that. Or I did do this. And look at me, guys. I'm so cool. And so we trade sin for sin, but we're still trapped in sin. We can't, we can't walk in the humility of, man, the Lord did a good thing in me. The Lord is working in me, and there's, no, uh, there's nothing that I'm doing that's, that's honoring me in that. And so, um, Romans 6, 5 through 7. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For, we, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Life lesson here is your freedom in Christ is not so you can do whatever you want. It is so that, so that you are free from the bondage of sin. Your freedom in Christ is not so you can do whatever you want. It is so that you are free from the bondage of sin. And so these guys were set free. They were set free. They were in prison, behind bars. They, were, uh, they had a guard. They were thrown into the common prison, as it says. Uh, they, they, were, they were nothing they could do to get out. An angel of the Lord came and, and freed them and gave them a message. That message was go and what? That message was go, share all the words of this life. And if you've been freed, God has given you that same message. That's the beginning of this book. The, the anthem, the, 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 the topic of the whole book, what this is about is, is Acts 1.8, right? But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be his witness to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so we have been told to, to go, tell the, tell the words of this life, tell the, uh, the good news, specifically about the word in Jesus. If you, if you were there again this Sunday, um, Pastor David brought up this, this scripture. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. And that struck me. So often I think of, I have a duty to share the gospel. I have a duty to share about, about Jesus. And I don't, I, don't, I don't often walk in this, I mean, honestly, I don't often walk in this reality that it's a privilege we have a sacred, blessed honor and privilege to share with people who don't worship the Lord about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. So what are those treasures? I mean, Petey was, Petey was talking about that it's, it's not like it's just a, a, a get out of jail free. He, he offers purpose. He offers peace. He offers prosperity, not just financially. He offers forgiveness. He offers healing. He offers second, third, fourth, fifth chances. He offers salvation. He offers sonship. He offers new life. He offers himself. This list can go on and on. Endless treasures available in Christ. Are you grabbing a hold of that idea that, that we have the privilege of telling people about the endless treasures of Christ? that's available to them, that's on offer. It's not like, oh, you can't do it because you can't do it. No, it's, it's available to all of them, and we get to share. Verse 22. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when they opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. You just kind of see them scratching. Oh, man. 
what on earth happened? We had these guys locked up. The guards don't even know what happened. They, we don't know if the, the angel put them in the trance. We, don't, we have no idea what happened. They're just gone. Door shut, guards there, that they're gone. High priests are scratching their head. I have no idea what we're going to do here. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in the prison were standing in the temple, teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on our head. Wait, what? Did not we, didn't we tell you guys not to, not to speak in this guy's name? What? Really? Why are you guys doing this? Don't you realize who we are? And so, what, first of all, why, why are the Sadducees... We have a, we're going to see here in a minute, G- Gamaliel stands up, who's a Pharisee, uh, that there's a, an interesting political aspect to their their relationship in this in this point in time that the Sadducees again they were the high intellectual aristocrat aristocratic you know tended to be very wealthy tended to be the majority of the Sanhedrin the Sanhedrin is the the group of of leaders of elders of the of the uh, um, nation of Israel and they and they uh, and the Pharisees tended to be they were teachers of the word they, they were um, more among the people. Yes, many of them were highly respected. Yes, many of them were, knew the word very, very well and taught the word. But they were, tended to be among the people. They lived among the people. They understood the people. And they were much more popular with the people because of that. And so you, you see that the Sadducees go out to seize these guys. They're, they're kind of having to kick the gloves, though, because everybody is seeing the power that these guys are displaying, which... The Sadducees say do not exist. There's, there's no supernatural power. But this guy was blind and now he walks. Uh, that's not what you see. But this guy was born crippled and now he's walking around. Yeah, but and so every time people saw these, every time people saw these uh, displays of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit that, that went against what the Sadducees would, were, were teaching, they were losing power in the minds of the people. They were losing the ability to con- control people because that, and that's where the anger comes from. That's where the, the indignation comes from. Yeah. Most of the high priests tend to, tended to be Sadducees, from what I understand. So um, they, they, that was kind of the priestly line, but I, I mean, that's not, that's not, that's Joel talking, not necessarily. Gospel. Would you know, Steve, by chance, or Tom? So they they tended to hold those the higher level, higher positions. Um, so it would be my guess right now. I don't don't. Don't hold my feet to the fire there. Um, okay, so completely went off notes here. Oh, the, the second thing here is, and do you intend to bring this man's blood on us all? Um, setting aside the irony of that statement <laughs> for the moment, setting aside that irony, let's go back to what they said in response to Pilate in Matthew uh, 17. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, let him be crucified. Then Pilate said, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. You see it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And he, and he had 
And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. They had called for this. The people, all the people of Israel standing in, the, in this response and call from Pilate called for the blood of Jesus to be, to be put on them. Again, the irony not knowing of this is what he was doing. This is the goal, that his blood would be poured on them. The Bible tells us that there is no remission of sin without the, the shedding of blood. And, and that's why God set up the sacrificial system. I was talking the other day with our kids. We, we celebrate Passover at home, at home as a family. And they would, they would take a lamb, their best lamb, and they'd bring that lamb in their home, and he'd live with them for a while. He, that lamb would live, and they'd, they'd learn to, to love this lamb. And it'd be like a little pet in their house. And then on Passover, they'd, help, they'd come and they'd put their hand on the lamb and they'd cut that lamb's neck because of sin. And it was a reminder that sin is a horrible thing. Just like, just like we saw up here with Ananias and Sapphira, God does not take sin lightly. He, he wants us to have a constant picture of how, what sin does. It, it, it kills, it separates us from him. It separates uh, people eternally from him. The Bible talks about the second death. That's, that's eternal separation from God because they chose, I don't want to have the blood. I don't, I, don't, I don't want this blood that was shed for me. And the final lamb, the perfect spotless lamb that was Jesus, that final lamb, I don't, I don't want to have any part in that. But here, these, here the council is accusing them saying you intend to bring this man's blood on us yeah yeah we do we hope we hope so we hope we can bring you to him so his blood covers you we hope so and the, so by d- to do that to bring the blood of Jesus on everybody on them, they've done what? They, they have filled Jerusalem with this gospel. Filled it. I, I can almost see the apostles there sitting in front of the council. Did he really say that? Yeah, we want to do that. Yes. Yes. We, want to, we filled Jerusalem with, yes, we did it. You almost see them like, I don't think they understand what they're saying. But, but praise the Lord when this can be said of us. When this can be said of the bridge that we have filled Kernersville. That we've filled the triad with this doctrine. I see PD and he is doing all he can. And I see a lot of men, men and women around here doing all they can. That, this, that the triad may be filled with this doctrine. And so I ask you to ask yourself, am I filling my spheres of influence with the gospel? Am I, is this doctrine that you are freed for, that you are freed from sin for, this doctrine of a final sacrifice that's, that, that, that washes, the way, washes away other people's sin? Are you, are you filling your spheres of influence with that gospel, with that doctrine? Am I trying to bring the cleansing blood of Jesus to everyone? I, I don't stand here unscathed by this. I don't at all. Father, help us, God, to to not take this lightly at all. Lord, this is what you freed us for. This is what you called us to do. You said go, go, go into Kernardsville, go into the triad, go into North Carolina, go into the world. Lord, put this burden on us. In Jesus' name. Verse 29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. There's an old Chinese curse, or so that's what it's attributed to. May you live in interesting times. 
Uh, men, we live in interesting times. Um, the Bible is, is very clear about the authorities in our lives were placed there by God himself. Uh, we as... Um, we as Americans almost have rebellion in our DNA. Our country is formed on rebellion. That's, that's how we came into being. Um, humans already are, have, a, have a natural rebellious heart. American on top of that, we tend to, mm, my rights, Arr. and I'm, I'm right there with you in that feeling, in that, Arr. But in Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So here we see an example laid out of civil disobedience. They, they have, the, the people in charge, the authorities over these men's lives that God has placed there, God has placed them there, even though they're not necessarily good men. God placed them there. They said, you don't go and speak in the name of Jesus. And they said, man, nope, we're gonna, we have to obey God rather than men. And so my, my point is that we, we muddy the waters and we need to be careful. And I think we are coming to a point in time in our, in our country, in our uh, society, where um, we're going to have to make a stand, man. That we're going to have to, we need to already make a stand in the, in the places of opinion and, and things like that. But we're going to have to make a stand for Christ that may have serious consequences soon. Not just people laugh at you, not just, eh, you're stupid. That may have serious consequences. If you, if you don't see what's been going on with, with the, uh, uh, the whole HB2 thing and all, I mean, th these are, this is this bubbling up of, oh, we want, to ha we want for you to, to allow our point of view, but if you have your point of view, uh -uh, no freedom for you. So, so we're going to have to begin to make a choice and stand. But, but we need to be careful. We need to be careful that we don't muddy the waters, that we're, we're standing in civil disobedience for my rights and my this and my that. Rather, we should stand in, dis, in civil disobedience for the cause of Christ, for His glory. Otherwise, we, just, we can easily just become a nuisance that we're not really standing for Christ. We're just a pain in the butt group of people that, that, are, that are always against the, against the rules or whatever, whatever can be said. We need to be careful to make sure that when we make a stand that is against what the authorities that God has placed in our life and God's as I say this, it makes me mad because that's not what I want to do. Just, just I'm, ugh, I'm a, ugh. I don't, I, you know, that's, don't even know how to articulate, but my heart is, my, my natural tendency is to be in rebellion against those who, who are trying to destroy the country around me. I just, but first my citizenship is with Christ. My citizenship, my kingdom, my first kingdom is the kingdom of Christ. And so I need to obey the authorities that God has put placed over me until the point they become in, in contrast with what God has said to do specifically. Make sure you have a biblically backed reason before you dis disobey the authority in your life. If you, if you do, you ought to obey God rather than men. Again, make sure you have a biblically backed reason before you disobey the authority in your life. If you do, you ought to obey God rather than men. Verse 30. The God of our fathers, this is Peter talking, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious 
and plotted to kill him. So why, again, were they furious? Because they're talking about the resurrection. They're preaching this resurrection power, this power over death. This Sadducee is like, that doesn't exist. But look at Jesus. (laughs) He rose again. Many people saw it. We saw it. We can testify of it. And it's, it's, this began to bubble up in the, in the Sadducees that they were, they were no more willing to just tell them, shh, shh be quiet, stop talking, be quiet. Now, okay, we're going to silence them. Forget this. We're not going to tell them to be silenced. We're going to silence them. John 15, 18 through 19. So we begin to see the hatred that that bubbles up against those who stand for Christ. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Martin Luther says, said, whenever the true message of the cross is abolished, the anger of the hypocrites and the heretics ceases, and all things are in peace. So what is he saying there? That when we no longer have the pure gospel in our churches, eh, people aren't going to be against our churches. People aren't going to be railing against things we say. People aren't going to be against you if you're not standing for the truth. Whenever the true message of the cross is abolished, the anger of the hypocrites and the heretics ceases, and all things are in peace. This is a sure token that the devil is guarding the entry to the house, and that the pure doctrine of God's word has been taken away. The church then is in the best state when Satan assaileth on every side, both with subtle slights and outright violence. And likewise, it is in the worst state when it is at the most peace. Guys, we're kind of in a, in a season of subtle slights, and, and it's kind of, in our culture, it's bubbling towards outright violence. And and if you look around the world in, 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 the, in the places where the church is growing, it's growing where there's outright violence. There's, the, China is, the church in China is just exploding. Uh, the church in many different places are, are exploding where, where there is persecution. Um, the church stands in object difference to the world. Where, whereas we tend to be too much like the world that the, yeah, what's the point? There's not, there's not much difference here. Matthew 5. Oops. Ooh, 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 hold on, sorry. Um, and so I'm not saying that we should be, like I said, we should, Everybody's going to hate us. I don't think any of us have that experience. I don't think anybody has that anywhere. That everybody's gonna, everybody. Oh, if I don't, if everybody doesn't hate me, then I'm not doing something right. And so, I, I, I'm, I'm, I temper this with the fact that God didn't call us to be jerks. He didn't call us to, to just, go out and be a pain in the butt to people. And this is part of why I spoke earlier about the, being careful of what what you stand in civil disobedience. Where where you branch off of the authority that God's given you is that if you're just constantly a pain in the butt against your authority, the message of the cross becomes muddied. Uh, you're not truly standing for the truth. You're standing for whatever various things you're going to upset for. There will be opposition, life lesson, when you stand for Christ. There will be opposition when you stand for Christ. Period. Verse 34. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel. This is Paul's, Paul's teacher. He's the one who, who f- took and found Paul, this very bright student. Gamaliel was one of the, one of the most highly respected men in the, in the area a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take heed to yourselves. Remember, there's this bubbling anger. We're we're just going to kill them. We're just going to kill them. Take heed to yourself. 
what you intend to do in regards to these men. For some time ago, Theudas rose up claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. Do you notice here the, 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 the examples he gives? People are being drawn away, and that's what's causing the anger. That's part of their losing power. That's what's causing part of the anger. And now I say to you, keep away from these men. Just ignore them. Let them alone. For if this plan or if this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. He lays out some good wisdom for us. He, he, I don't think he quite went far enough. There's, there's not a middle ground in life where we're either with God or not with God. and We're, we're, we're either fighting the Lord or, or we're fighting with the Lord. There's not a, a middle ground, a sideline, bleachers that we can watch in. There's none of that. We're either on one side of the battle or on the other side of the battle. We may not be effective on either side but we're on one side or the other, and we're going one direction or the other. But he lays out some very valuable, um, basic life lesson here. When, when, you are, when you're in a situation where you don't know what, what's right or wrong, you don't know the Lord's will on something, wait, pray, wait. There's, there's no compulsion to do something right away. Pray. Pray and wait. See, see what the Lord. See what's going to come of it. See what the Lord is going to do in it. And he's, he's absolutely right. It's not as though um, the Lord is going to uh, lose. Life lesson: You either fight with God or fight against God. And guess who wins in the end? Um, verse forty. No, go to the end. And they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as a Christ. <laughs> and so... <laughs> First of all, they agreed with him, but they just beat him for the heck of it. Uh, okay, it's pretty smart, but mm, 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 I just need to get some of that out. They just took a, took a whooping to him. But they, but they came out in joy. They came out singing praises. And so I'm gonna... Kierkegaard, the tyrant dies and his rule is over. The martyr dies and his rule begins. This is, these guys were not martyred yet most of them will be but when they stood and they walked out in joy or when a martyr when, when a martyr stands and and dies praising the lord that doesn't that, that doesn't leave the minds of those who martyred him that doesn't leave their mind and we're not talking obviously about the the twisted idea of an islamic martyr who goes to kill people. We're talking about the, the biblical idea of a Christian martyr who dies in innocence. So, um, the tyrant dies and his rule is over. There's no, nobody, he holds no more power. The martyr dies and his rule begins. Uh, that We see that in the life of the Apostle Paul as, he, as they stoned Stephen. He... Just, actually, Petey brought it up this week, I think, about the fact that um, his first message that, that, Paul, that we see from Paul is just about a, a carbon copy of the message that he stood there and listened as to Stephen give right before they stoned him. And so the martyrdom of Stephen began to rule and work in the heart and mind of, of the Apostle Paul until the Lord did the work in his heart. Okay. Spurgeon, never did the church so much prosper and so truly thrive as when she was baptized in blood. The ship of the church never sails so gloriously along as when the bloody spray of her martyrs falls on her deck. 
We must suffer and we must die if we are ever to conquer this world for Christ. And I'm not trying to paint a dark, brutal picture. Um, as, as we see in this, in this chapter, at the end of this chapter, they walk away singing and praising the Lord. that They were counted worthy to suffer. They were beaten. They spent a night in jail. This was the early days of the persecution. Not, this was kind of a light, a light thing. But we, we have seen throughout history very, very severe persecution on the church. We've lived in kind of a Disneyland here in America where everything's easy, we've got all we want, we've got all we need, and that's kind of what's brought the church to the state it's at. We're not, we're not, we're not set apart much from the world. I watch the same TV, I, I do everything the same, I, I spend my money the same way, I do everything, maybe with a quick Christian twist on it, but it's not really set apart from the rest of the world. And, and that's, you know, if you, again, if you look at the churches around the world that are growing, the, 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 in the countries where they're growing, they're growing in countries where, where there have been uh, much martyrdom and much persecution. And I don't wish persecution on us whatsoever. Uh, but if, if you're wise, if you look up, it's coming. It's coming. If you pay attention to what's going on on the political plane, if you're going to make a stand for Christ, it's coming. And so we need to prepare ourselves for that. Matthew 5, 11, and 12. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And I say, men, look up and gird yourself for battle. There's a, there's a, there's a battle going on already, and, and you may well be losing that battle right now, right now if, you're not, if you're not actively fighting it, actively preparing yourself, actively getting in the Word. There, there's a, uh, the picture in Ephesians that we have, and I'm going to read it here in a second, is that there's a, there's a process that you put on your breastplate and you, and you gird yourself up and you, and, you, and you shod your feet and you get ready. There's a, there's a preparation going on. And yes, there should, there should be a preparation in day in and day out life for the, for the battles, the spiritual battles going on in life. But we need to be using these battles and using this time to prepare, looking forward that there's been a, there's been a war waged against us. And we need to be prepared. There's a war waged against the church of God. We're going to win. We're going to win. If you stand on the right side, we're going to win. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this dark age and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. This, is, this should, should stand as a, as a reminder to us, we're not standing against a certain people group. We're not standing against people with, with a certain political view that's different than ours. They're not the enemy. The enemy is, is, is the one that's controlling the hearts and the minds of this world. That's the enemy. Those are the enemies. And so... So while we should stand and while we should fight and while we should understand we need to be uh, prepared, our enemy is not the people. They may, be, they may see us as their enemy, but they're not our enemy. And so we need to project love towards them. We need to continue to, to, to fill them with the doctrine um, of the gospel. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and have, and have having done what, jeez, I can't read, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with tr truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Ab above all, taking the shield of faith, which is with you, golly, Let's try this again. We're having reading problems. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer 
and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And so I ask, do do you want to rejoice when that battle comes? Do you want to rejoice now in the daily battles? Or or, or do we... Ephesians 6, yep. That was specifically 10, 10 through 20. We can rejoice in the daily battles. The daily... Your car got a flat. You know, somebody ran in, ran into you. Somebody whom you loved became very sick, and did not. You, you didn't. You didn't get the 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 healing power that you had prayed for, that you'd hoped for. But you, we need to stand even in those battles. And do, and can you? And do you want to stand and rejoice that you are counted worthy to suffer in those day in and day out battles? You will not rejoice that you are counted worthy to suffer for his name if you do not prepare yourself for battle. We've got to be preparing for battle. Otherwise, we tend to stand and complain. We tend to stand and, like I talked about last week, looking over there and over there. But look, they have a nice thing and they have a nice thing and they have a nice thing. And I want to take all the nice things and make them my things and give all the bad things away to other people. And that's kind of how... We look at the, the good over there, and I, I don't want any of this bad stuff. I don't want the, the, the difficult things going on. But that's not how the world works. And so we, we need to not stand in complaint. We need to stand in preparation, prepared to deal with the small battles going on day in and day out. The choice, am I going to cut on the TV, or am I going to open up the Scriptures? Am I going to you know, do whatever else with the family, or, or are we going to sit down and... Open the scriptures together and prepare yourself. Am I going to pray with my wife? Even maybe when we're, we're, we're in a tiff, am I going to, let's just pray, sweetie. Or am I going to, pff, whatever, go to bed. It's those decisions that we're, that we're making. And we, but we can't make those decisions well if we're not prepared and realize that that's part of the battle. And then there's a, a greater battle that I think is coming of, of the of the world around us that's turning against us rapidly, that already is, and there's already a slights, and there's verbiage, and there's, they're already talking things. It doesn't take long for talk to turn into action. And so we need to be preparing ourselves, preparing our hearts, preparing our minds on our knees, preparing our family in the same way so that we can, that we can end that day that we can rejoice that we were counted to, worthy to suffer for his name. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you, God, for your word, and I thank you, Lord, for, um, God, your power that, that we get to see on display here in Acts and we get to see on display here in our church. Um, and, Lord, also the the more typical power of uh, Lord you just powering our lives apart from sin helping us make choices God that honor you helping helping us stand when we're weak thank you Lord for that power Uh, God I I pray for our country Lord Uh, it is my heart that Lord our country would repent and turn to you Lord, and you said that if your people were called by your name, if we would get on our knees and pray, uh, we would repent, Lord, that you would, you would do that work in this country. So, Lord, stir up in us to be praying on behalf of our country, on behalf of our neighbors, on behalf of those around us, on behalf of our coworkers. But, Lord, in the same time, prepare our hearts Lord, to stand in joy um, even in a storm. And I thank you for these men. I thank you, God, for 
uh, the time here to open your word, the freedom to do it today. Help us, Lord, not to fear, but to prepare. Fear is not of you. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.